Recently, when Dennis said, I won't be hearing to them until tomorrow night, I was thinking, well, unless we hear on the news, some little four-year-old boy is up in the cockpit flying a plane <laughs> in India. <laughs> so, uh, well, let's, uh, let's pray. Ah, good morning, Jesus. You're on the throne, in control. And is, even as we laugh about it, Lord, um, you are with those who are in India, in Russia, in South America, and right here in Wausau, and you love us dearly, and um, that is amazing. So... Um, any intelligent word, Lord, that comes out of my mouth is from you, and I just pray that you will um, be active and alive, and it'll be your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, for starters, um, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 8 today. <clears throat> So if you open up Deuteronomy 8, and uh, we're going to work, work our way through this uh, chapter, um, just to give you a little bit of a heads up, um, I'm going to do a couple weeks on praise. Am I on next week? Okay. And then I'm not here next week, the following, and then I think I'll finish it up. So... I got kind of a three-week mindset on praise. So that's going to be the, the focus and such. So as we dive into Deuteronomy, um, please put that in mind. So Deuteronomy 8, um, and it's interesting. This is uh, just a couple chapters after the Deuteronomy impress it on the children. Um, so in some ways, this kind of goes hand in hand about passing on the commands and such. So, to give you some background here, Deuteronomy um, chapter 9 actually gives you reference. Hear, O Israel, you are now about to cross the Jordan and go in to the nations greater and stronger than you with large cities and have walls up to the sky. Hmm. So, they are right on the edge of going into the promised land. And, and this is Moses giving them a rally cry and encouragement and exhortation of before they go into the promised land. Um, so I want you to remember a couple words here as we go through this. Um, the word remember the word humble, the word pride or proud, as you link those together, and then, of course, praise. So, as we um, read through this, um, keep those in mind. So, Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, be careful to follow every command I am giving you today. And remember, one of those commands was what they was just talked about is press on to our children that's one of those commands if you go back in Deuteronomy just a couple chapters before but that I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on an oath to your forefathers remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you. If we stop right there, to humble you and to test you, we will eventually link that down to uh, verse 16, where he also says to humble you and to test you. So that this is kind of how the whole passage links together. Um, to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart. Whether you would keep his commands or not so 
the kids that we have here, are you glad to be out of school? Why? How come? Holly, you're a senior now, why? You don't have to see Henry every day. <laughs> that wasn't the answer I was expecting. So, most likely you didn't like the tests. You know what? They give you all this work and then they make you take a test on it. If you're in college, they make you take these tests. Why do we, why do we have tests? To find out what you know to find out what you know. I send my kids off to college and they take the final test and if they didn't learn anything, I want my money back. <laughs> but the tests are to find out what you know. Well, this is more of a, I mean, that's more of a head knowledge thing. This is more of a what's in your heart. Is once again, Yes, God wants you to have the head knowledge, but he's really concerned about your heart. It's all about your heart. It's about your heart with him and your heart with Christ. So, so he tested them to know what was in their heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. You know, the other thing is um, when you get tested in these situations, you also find out where you turn to. In the hard times, you find out, do I turn to God? Do I turn to others? Do I turn to this, that, the other thing? So a lot of times that test, we find out what's in your heart and you get to see where do I turn when the chips are down. And so once again, it's all about our heart, and he's testing us, in essence, to show us what's in our hearts and where do we turn to. Um, so, starting back up in uh, verse 3, once again, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known. I'm going to just stop right there if you notice that he humbled you causing you okay we don't like tests but sometimes he allows the test to come we shake our fist and say why did you do this God why did you allow this to come but you know what the Israelites here he humbled them causing them to hunger so that then he could provide. Once again, to find out what's in your heart. It's all about the heart issue. So, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Hmm. Hmm. Once again, are we living for bread? Or are we just living for material things which do not satisfy? Because you know what? What's, what's the thing with manna? What's the thing with eating? You get hungry the next day. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. So once again, are we just concerned about bread or the worldly things that do not last or do we crave and seek and want God's word because once again that fulfills the heart the soul the longing um, of us so to teach you that man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in, in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Huh. You know, as a, as a parent who's now gotten our, my kids older, they're all in college and beyond, 
I can tell you that um, one of the most loving acts you can do to your kids is to discipline them. The world might tell you give them everything, but no, it is a very, if you discipline them in a loving manner with love behind it, it is one of the most important things you can do for your kids besides point them to Christ. God disciplines. I mean, right here, God disciplines his son. Um, why shouldn't we also follow? Discipline. Um, verse 6, observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in his way and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springing flowers in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranate, olive oil, and honey. <clears throat> a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Wow. Sounds like a cool place to live. We will come back to this, but probably since this passage, and this is just, I mean me talking not theologically probably since this passage there was probably no other greater land of milk and honey since then than when um, the discovery of America you, you read this passage and go you know what that could be America um, if you talk about it I've, I've read some books on Lewis and Clark and in their expedition where they go up through these lands and such they said over and over is Wow, it's like we're back in the Garden of Eden. The lushness of America. And we'll get back to that point. But one other thought on that is um, you read this and the lushness of the land that the Israelites were going into. Um, beautiful, beautiful land. You read that and go, wow, what a great place to live. What's interesting is at the end of World War II, what did the world do? They created Israel again. And what was the land that they gave them? Well, their land. And why did they give it to them? Because it was worthless. If you read back in the history of around World War II, that land was desolate, good for nothing, dusty, dry, and almost inhabitable. And so the nation said, you know what, let's just give the Jews that land because you know what, it's worth nothing. And it's interesting how that land went from the land of milk and honey to a land that is worthless. But now that Israel has lived in that land for 70 plus years, how fertile and lush and beautiful it is becoming again. Just an interesting side note, that's, that's interesting. So, we've got this land. So now, um, here's kind of the, the, the heart of meat of, of Deuteronomy 8. When you have eaten and are satisfied. I want to I stop right here so that everyone's on page. Everyone have breakfast this morning? Everyone eat yesterday? Satisfied? We, we all fall into this category. Um, we are blessed more than just about every other place in the world. We have food. We are satisfied. We are blessed. So um, this is certainly um, pointing us um, to us that we are blessed and are satisfied. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God. For the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses, settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have, mul and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. Stop right there. So, 
There's a lot in this part. There's a lot in this part. Okay? First of all, this is not prosperity gospel. This is not, you know what, um, I always thank God, so therefore he's going to bless me, bless me, bless me. No, there are testing, there are trials. Jesus said, you will be persecuted if you follow me. Okay, this is not what this is about. But God does bless us with things. He blessed the Israelites. He blessed the Israelites. And did you hear that little phrase that he says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, comma, praise the Lord your God. Praise the Lord your God. So when you have a blessing, have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God. So why would he say that? Well, for starters, he made us. He kind of knows our inclinations, what we would do. But he says, praise the Lord your God. See, it's not the riches that cause our hearts to become proud, but it is forgetting the Lord. It's not having that cause our hearts to come, become proud. It's forgetting the Lord. So if you, if you compare the two, so if you look at verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, and then you also um, jump down to verse 12, it says, otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied, same phrase, when you're eaten and are satisfied, the first one says, when you do that, you should praise the Lord. The next one says, when you eat and are satisfied, and then it talks about the houses, and it just expands it some more. It says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget your, your God. Your heart will become proud and you will forget your God. Hmm. So, God tells us to praise God. Otherwise, our heart will become proud and we will forget God. Okay? Let's, um, let's step back here and uh, talk about pride. Because part of my gist is, you know what? Praise the Lord, your God, keeps you becoming prideful. It keeps you becoming prideful. So, you know, let's talk about pride for a second. Um, you know, one of the first sins in the Bible for humans was Adam and Eve, but that's not the first sin. See, Satan was up in heaven, and Satan was created as this beautiful being, beautiful being. He was, he was one step below God, at least in his mind. He was still a created being, but he was beautiful. And in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 17, <clears throat> it talks, this passage is about kicking Satan out of heaven. So it's talking about Satan here. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and your corruption, your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Um, Satan's heart became proud. That's why God casted him out. Casted him out. So one has to think about it. Okay, um, if that's what got Satan kicked out of heaven, why should I be concerned about pride? Hmm, we should probably take a closer look at that. So what is pride? What is pride? That God wants us to stay away from it. See, he wants us to be humble and not prideful. So what, what is pride? Well, pride is, you know, kind of a, a conglomerate of definitions. Pride is um, having great joy in your achievements, accomplishments, um, accomplishments of someone else that you identify with and because of that 
you find your self-worth, your value, and your joy in that. Let me repeat that. You find your self-worth and your value and your joy in something you have done or accomplished or someone else has done that you identify with, and that's where you get your self-worth, value, and joy. So unless that definition is placed on Jesus Christ, everything else will fail. That's why pride is so bad, because you get your self-worth, your value, based on something I've done or associated with. And every time, outside of Christ, that will fail you. Your self-worth, your self-esteem will fail you because I'm putting my hopes in this. Even the phrase, I'm proud to be an American, you know, we're putting our hope and trust in America. You know what? God changes America. So many times in today's culture, parents put their hope and pride in their kids. Poor kids, of course they're going to fail. And what's that going to do to the kids? What's that going to do to the parents when we, when we place all of our value on our kids and we take pride in our kids we take pride in anything other than Christ so you might say hmm so the pride equals forgetting forgetting equals pride they kind of go hand in hand so once again here is God saying, you know what, when you've eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord. Because you know what, as you praise something else, it takes it off of us. We praise God for who he is and what he's provided. You know what, it no longer is grounded and rooted in us. Which is a very good thing because we can't live up to that expectation. So God is saying, you know, praise the Lord after you have eaten and are satisfied. It keeps you humble. Praising God keeps you humble. And oh, by the way, um, there's a proverb uh, 3.34 that said, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Um, There are two gentlemen in the Bible that, that quote that. That'd be James and Peter, two of Jesus' close disciples. In uh, James, uh, James quotes it in 1 Peter, they quote it. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You don't think sitting around the campfire after fishing and as they talk that Jesus didn't quote that verse many times, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, that two of them would, would rewrite it in their letters in the New Testament? Think about that for a second. God opposes the proud. Satan's over here, kicks him out of heaven. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So once again, that's a challenge for our heart. Where are we putting our hope and trust and our self-worth and self-esteem and joy in? Is it in other things that we become proud of or is it in Christ? Because one of the most humbling things is to acknowledge that, you know what, I can't live up to God's standard and I have to accept Jesus as my payment. How humbling is that? I, I, I can do nothing. Christ has done it all. That is the ultimate humble step is I accept Christ for what he's done because I can do nothing. So God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Um, wow. Wow. 
That's why we want to continue to praise Him so that it keeps our heart humble and focused on Him. So if we continue in here, verse 14, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, the thirst and waterless land, with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and test you. Once again, we, we link that back up the first part of chapter 8. To humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. Wow. Humble and tested. We keep our hearts humble and God tests us to see where our hearts are. And it says so that it might go well with you in the end. Don't we want it all to go well with us in the end? So what does that mean? We need to stay humble. We need to stay humble that it may go well with us in the end. Once again, our hearts humble, not on us, on Christ, on Christ. Um, hmm. I love these next two verses. Um, you may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms this covenant. Did, did we get that? Just like there are many parts to the church, God gives each and every one of us different abilities. So how can we get pride in our ability if it comes from God? Actually, isn't it great that God doesn't make us all the same? That we, we don't have all the same abilities? Can you imagine what this world would be like if we were all tax accountants? Come on, Steve, you're shaking your head. You know, we're all introverts. If you, <laughs> if you ever go to a tax conference, you get all these guys that come in there and they sit down and they don't want to talk to anybody. The funniest thing, I just laugh. Lunchtime, tax accountant seminar. We sit in around tables, like eight to ten of us, and we all sit there and we all stare at our food like it is the most important object in this world. And we all sit there and no one talks. Isn't it great that God didn't make us all that way? Not to really go down a, a rabbit trail, but my sixth sense of humor really wants to someday go to one of those tax conferences all dressed out in leather biker <laughs> studs on the gloves and go walking into that tax conference and just sit down and all those little tax accountants and I'm one of them with I don't have a pocket protector they would just freak out <laughs> yeah they'd cry <laughs> Isn't it great that God doesn't give us the same abilities? The same abilities? But right about now, somebody might go, wait a minute here. This is not fair. We all have different abilities. Is that fair? Unfortunately, we live in a society that pays millions of dollars to someone who that can throw a ball, you know, 100 miles an hour and strike out people or a football or sing and we live in a society that pays them an enormous amount of money. And the ones who take care of Alzheimer's patients in a rest home, 
the one who takes care of kids at a daycare, why is it they are paid the least amount? That's where we live, okay? I, I'm not gonna, we're not, we're not up here to agree, disagree, or change that. But, because if you do, then you say, well, this is not fair that I didn't get the ability of someone else. Well, first of all, in Matthew, in the Beatitudes, God says, you know what? I know you need food, shelter, and clothing. Okay? He will provide to you no matter what job you are working if you use prudence and wisdom on your spending. God knows what you need. And he maybe gave you the ability to do that job. So then you then you still go back to, well, is that fair? Why would, he, why would he do that? Why would he do that? This is awesome. Because of your ability that God has given you, you will come into contact with people that need Christ that I or the person next to you sitting cannot reach out to. He gives you the ability, and maybe it's to take care of kids. I don't have that ability. But you will come across people while taking care of kids that Christ has put in your life that you can share the gospel and be a light to him, whereas I don't have any effect on them. I come into contact with people because of my ability that I can share Christ and the gospel that maybe you have zero chance of talking to or sharing the gospel with. We have farmers, we have mechanics, we have accountants, we have teachers. Every one of you has an ability from God. It says right here that God has given you the ability gives you the ability and he has given you that ability to put you in contact with someone that needs Christ and you can shine your light for Christ right where you are because you have the ability to touch someone's life in that situation if we were all tax accountants there are a lot of people that we could never reach that we'd never reach um I helped out with high school kids two years ago. There was a couple kids in there that, you know what, I just, I, I just, because of my personality and, and things like that, I just, I just couldn't reach. But there's a farmer in here that is a magnet to those kids. I've seen a couple of those kids just flock to him. And you know what? It's his ability for what he does. He can share the gospel with those kids, whereas I can't. So if you're sitting there saying, you know what? I didn't get the ability of so-and-so. I didn't get the ability to so-and-so. That's okay, because you know what? God gave you that ability to be a light for him in your spot that you are in. One of the greatest witnesses for Christ. If you want to lead people to Christ, do your job well. Do your job to the best of your ability so that people will see a difference in you and say, why? Why do you care? Why do you go the extra mile? Why do you do such a good job? Because that is your witness to a lost world, and that is the way that you reach Christ by the way you do your job. And they notice that there is something different about this person, and wow, what is it? And once again, God, your God given ability has got your foot in the door to be a light to those people. Once again, wow, what a praise to God. You know what? He didn't give me the ability of 
every one of you. And you know what? That is a praise because he's got a special job just for me and my ability. And he's got a special job for each one of you and your ability. Wow. Once again, thank you, Jesus, for what you've provided. And it keeps me humble that he's given me this ability to reach this person for Christ. Not the world, this person. Once again, wow. That keeps you humble. Wow. And we continue to praise him and say, thank you, God. I praise you, God. And all praise and honor and glory back to him. So, so when you do your job and use your ability to the fullest, all praise and honor and glory go back to him. Yesterday was a uh, track meet. It's been state track meet the last uh, four days. There's a kid from Hardington I just love watching. His name is Carson Naker. I might have the last name butchered. Huh? The guy's fast. The guy doesn't lose. Oh yeah, he lost in Norfolk to a guy. And But what makes him so awesome is after every race they interview him and it's all praise and glory to God for the ability that he has given me. And he lost one race in Norfolk. And you know what? He still praised God for the ability. And once again, what an example of ability. I do it to the best of my ability. And then when I succeed at it, I give all praise, honor, and glory to him. And you can tell he's humble. So I challenge you to take your abilities that God has given you, use them to the best of your ability, and then all praise and honor and glory go to him. Because once again, God says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord. Please do not miss that. Praising the Lord keeps you humble. And humble keeps you dependent on Christ. And humility actually is a beautiful thing in this world. And it draws people to Christ. I do have to read the last two verses. Okay? Remember we said how America was this land of milk and honey? But we have to, we have to finish verse 8. Because here's the consequences of forgetting if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed like the nations the Lord destroyed before you. So you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. God's word there are greater than anything I could say. All I can say is to do your part, stay humble, praising God, because that's what keeps our heart humble, praising him. All praise, honor, and glory go to you, Jesus. Keeps my heart humble, and I use my ability to, sh uh, to um, spread Christ to those I come into contact with. Let's pray. Jesus, you have blessed us. You have blessed us. And we give you praise and honor for what we have comes from you. Our ability comes from you. And most importantly, our salvation comes to you from you. And we humbly just stand before you and give you praise and honor. It's not about us. It's about you. And help us to use our ability not to line our pockets of worldly gain, but to use our abilities that you have given us 
to share Christ with a nation that is in desperate need of a Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be closing with the doxology, which you know as the doxology, for those of you who grew up singing that. Um, I'm going to slow it way down, and we're going to sing it probably about three times, and it has a little bridge in there. Um, so the timing is going to be slowed way down with a lot more pause. So I just follow us. Um, we'll, we'll do it, like I said, three times, and then keep building. So. Why don't you please stand? <laughs>
In Revelation 5, verse 12, it says, In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We were created to praise him, so let us praise him. Praise God from whom all blessings. 